If you have difficulty recognizing faces, you're not alone. You stand in the company of many distinguished people. Several extremely well-known and accomplished individuals also are having difficulty. These include actor Brad Pitt, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, primatologist Jane Goodall, and comedian and actor Stephen Fry, among others. According to Healthline.com, Brad Pitt had stated that regarding his belief that he has prosopagnosia, quote, he fears this has led people to believe he's remote, aloof, inaccessible, and self-absorbed. And I would like to thank Mr. Brad Pitt for opening up about this. I know that there are many people who suffer from this and are inspired and comforted by seeing the tremendous success of Mr. Pitt in the entertainment industry despite having prosopagnosia. Living with prosopagnosia, often termed facial blindness, reshapes one's daily experience in a world where facial recognition is taken for granted. Every day, individuals with this condition navigate through a maze of faces, each as unfamiliar as the last, even if they belong to close family members or dear friends. Morning routines, for example, can be slightly jarring. Even a glance in the bathroom mirror might require a few moments of adjustment, as even recognizing one's own reflection isn't instantaneous. To counteract this, many develop specific personal markers, perhaps a favorite pair of earrings, a distinct hairstyle, or even a tattoo. These become anchors in the daily life, helping to identify quickly their own image and foster a consistent sense of self. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Gary Krause, neurosurgeon and founder of the Krause TBI Institute in Houston, Texas. The Krause TBI video podcast is dedicated to shedding light upon mysteries of traumatic brain injury. And we do this by studying the brain, both in its normal state as well as after it has suffered a traumatic brain injury. I've written a book about traumatic brain injury, which was recently published. In chapter seven, which is entitled, Agnosias, Aphasias, Apraxias, and Agraphias, etc., I discuss prosopagnosia and many other subtle but important cognitive changes which may occur in the brain, especially after a traumatic brain injury, but also after a stroke, hemorrhage from hypertension, or an aneurysm rupture or otherwise. Now, let's get back to prosopagnosia. The challenges of prosopagnosia amplify when we leave the safety of our home. In professional or educational settings, relying solely on facial cues is not an option. The office, for example, with its myriad of colleagues, demands a different approach to interaction. The voice echoing from a cubicle, the style of shoes someone wears, the scent of a specific type of perfume, or the location and decor of a workspace all become vital clues to deciphering identities. Lunch breaks and group meetings can become a delicate dance. The person with prosopagnosia might sit down with a group trying to figure out who each individual is just based on the conversation's context or the unique mannerisms of an individual. There's always an underlying fear of making a faux pas, like introducing oneself again to a longtime colleague or possibly mistaking a boss for a peer. People with prosopagnosia face challenges. For instance, in watching movies, they often confuse characters, struggle to recognize recurring actors and characters, and they might miss emotional cues due to the difficulty interpreting facial expressions. Fast-paced scenes can be disorienting, and they might feel disconnected from pop culture discussions or not recognize celebrities. To adapt, they frequently rely on non-facial cues like voice or clothing. Yet, out of this daily struggle emerge remarkable adaptive skills. Many with face blindness hone their listening skill abilities becoming attuned to the nuances in voices or picking up on most subtle changes in someone's tone. They might remember intricate details about a person's life or hobbies or preferences. 
thus compensating for their inability to recognize faces with a deeper understanding and appreciation of the person's essence. Physical attributes, such as posture, gait, or the way someone laughs, become vital identification markers. Over time, this heightened sensitivity allows them to forge profound connections, transcending the hurdles of facial recognition. Their journey, although it's filled with challenges, can offer a unique perspective on interpersonal connections and the myriad ways we recognize and relate to one another. Let's go over a bit of neuroanatomy or anatomy in the brain, which is related to prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is intricately linked to specific areas of the brain that are responsible for processing facial information. These areas of the brain include the following, the fusiform gyrus, anterior inferior temporal cortex, superior temporal sulcus, occipital facial area, connecting pathways like the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. Now, although I mentioned these areas of the brain by name, it's unimportant to remember them at this time. What is important is to rather recognize that there are very specialized areas of the brain which play a pivotal role in our recognition of faces. Now here we are looking at the brain. Uh, this is the left side of the brain, the left hemisphere. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain, the top and the bottom. In order for us to see, there are many processes in the brain that have to take place relatively perfectly for the whole system to work. So the eyes, which would be here in the front of the head, send information through the optic nerves to the brain. They get relayed through a portion of the brain called the thalamus, and they get sent to the back of the brain, known as the occipital lobe. From the occipital lobe, which is the primary visual area, they supply information to supplementary visual areas around this region, and then send it by a couple of major tracks along to other parts of the brain. Portions of the brain involved in facial recognition are under the deep surfaces of the brain. There are the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and other portions of the temporal lobe. So these regions help to put together this complex array of uh, information and processing of the brain so that we can not only see, but we can add additional dimensions to the site, such as recognition of faces in this case. Let's discuss the prevalence of prosopagnosia. This is a bit of a challenging uh, topic because it's difficult to determine the specific prevalence due to variations in the severity of the condition. And many individuals may suffer from prosopagnosia, although they may not be formally diagnosed. It is estimated that about 2% of the general population may have some form of developmental prosopagnosia. And that means that in a group of about 50 people, there's likely at least one individual with this condition. Now, recently, a study led by researchers at Harvard Medical School and the VA Boston Healthcare System suggests that this condition, prosopagnosia, may be more common than previously thought. Uh, they found that about one in 33 people, which is just over 3%, might meet the criteria for face blindness Translating to more than 10 million Americans, the researchers propose expanding the diagnostic criteria to be more inclusive. Another study conducted at Dartmouth College reported a case of severe face blindness in a 28-year-old who had suffered uh, COVID-19 and had, uh, was considered a long hauler with symptoms. Uh, the patient developed prosopagnosia after a severe COVID-19 infection and it experienced difficulties recognizing faces, including her own family members. This suggests that COVID-19 can cause severe and persistent neuropsychological problems, including deficits in facial recognition. Let's go over some important facts about prosopagnosia. There are two types of prosopagnosia. One is developmental or known as congenital, and the other is acquired. Developmental prosopagnosia occurs without any evident brain damage, and it's thought to arise from a failure in the normal maturation of the brain's face processing mechanisms. On the other hand, acquired prosopagnosia results from damage to the brain, usually from trauma, such as in a traumatic brain injury or stroke or certain other diseases. 
Now, while prosopagnosia is primarily associated with face recognition, it can also sometimes be accompanied by difficulties in recognizing other objects or distinguishing between different types of objects, which is a condition known as object agnosia. The condition can have profound social implications because facial recognition plays a crucial role in human interactions. Individuals with this condition, prosopagnosia, often develop compensatory strategies, and these include such as relying more on voice, clothing, hair, and jewelry to recognize people. Recent research has suggested that there may be a genetic component to developmental prosopagnosia because the condition sometimes runs in families. Now, what is our history of understanding of prosopagnosia? The history and origin of prosopagnosia, as understood within the medical and scientific community, offers us a unique glimpse into the evolution of neuroscience and the understanding of cognitive disorders. While the phenomena of face blindness might have been present throughout human history, the scientific documentation of prosopagnosia began in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries. The term itself, prosopagnosia, is derived from the Greek words. First, prosopon, meaning face, and next, agnosia, meaning lack of knowledge. The first clinical report of a patient with facial recognition deficits following brain damage is often attributed to the German neurologist, Dr. Joachim Bodemer, who described the condition in detail in the 1940s. He documented cases of individuals who, after suffering brain injuries, particularly in warfare, lost their ability to recognize familiar faces, including their own reflection. Yet, their ability to recognize people using other sensory cues like voice or gait remained intact. Throughout the mid 20th century, as neuroimaging techniques like CAT scans and later MRI became more readily available, uh, research began to identify correlations between prosopagnosia and damage to specific areas of the brain, and in particular, the fusiform gyrus, a particular location on the right hemisphere. These discoveries solidified our understanding that certain regions of the brain are necessary and specialized for facial recognition. While the early focus of facial blindness was focused on acquired prosopagnosia resulting from brain damage, by the late 20th century, researchers actually started recognizing that some individuals had face recognition difficulties without any evidence of brain injury. And that led us to the understanding that developmental or congenital prosopagnosia exists, suggesting that this condition can be present from birth or early childhood. Let's advance to our current understanding. Today, with advanced neuroimaging techniques, such as MRI, functional MRI, other types of studies, and also with cognitive testing. Our understanding of prosopagnosia has grown considerably. We do recognize that a spectrum of severity exists, and we have a better grasp of the neural mechanisms involved. Still, despite this, many believe that prosopagnosia remains underdiagnosed, especially developmental cases, as individuals often develop coping mechanisms or might not even realize their facial recognition abilities are atypical. We have to adjust and adapt. There are no known cures for prosopagnosia, but certain strategies and interventions can help an individual cope with the condition. Let's go through some of these. First, compensatory strategies. People with prosopagnosia often develop their own ways to recognize individuals, such as relying on voice recognition, they might listen for unique tones or speech patterns. Physical cues, they may notice distinctive hairstyles, body shape, gait, or other physical attributes. Context, recognizing people based on where they are and when they usually see them. Clothing and accessories, observing specific items of clothing, glasses, jewelry that people may typically wear. Next, technological aids. Some software apps have been developed to assist people with face blindness. These can help identify and label familiar faces, providing real-time assistance in social settings. Third, training programs. 
Some researchers explored the potential benefits of specific training programs aimed to improve face recognition skills. These often involve repetitive exercises, such as analyzing and memorizing facial features. However, their effectiveness may vary from person to person. Fourth, psychoeducation. Educating individuals with prosopagnosia and those around them about the condition may be beneficial. Understanding the neurological basis of the condition can reduce feelings of frustration and self-blame. Fifth, support groups. Joining a support group, either online or in person, can provide emotional support, coping strategies, and a sense of community. Sharing experiences and solutions with others who have had the same condition can be reassuring and helpful. Sixth, therapy. Some people with prosopagnosia may benefit from therapy, especially if they experience anxiety, depression, or social withdrawal due to their condition. Therapists can provide coping strategies and emotional support. And seventh, educational interventions. For children with prospectnosia, tailored educational interventions can be beneficial. Teachers can be informed about the condition and use things like name tags, fixed seating arrangements, or other strategies to help the child. It's important to remember that prosopagnosia may vary in severity, and what works for one person might not work for another. A combination of these personalized strategies and available resources tend to be most effective approach for managing the challenges associated with prosopagnosia. So let's summarize what we've talked about. The journey of understanding prosopagnosia spans from wartime clinical observations to sophisticated neuroscientific uh, studies, reflecting the broader evolution of cognitive neuroscience and shedding light on intricacies of human facial recognition. Prosopagnosia is a complex neurological disorder. It provides valuable insights into the intricate processes of facial recognition and the brain's adaptive capabilities. It's a neurological disorder that impairs the ability to recognize faces, essentially causes face blindness, even to those closest to us. Those affected often rely on other cues, such as clothing, hairstyle, or voice to identify people. Everyday tasks like grocery shopping or navigating public places become intimidating as facial cues that we take for granted are lost to those with prosopagnosia. There could be frustration with not being able to recognize even your own reflection or to greet a loved one with confidence. Celebrities may be unrecognizable. Watching movies may be difficult because it's difficult to distinguish one actor for another. While there is no cure for prosopagnosia or face blindness, awareness and understanding can greatly improve the lives of those affected. Recognition of this condition allows for empathy, patience, and support. Together, we can spread awareness and foster a more inclusive society for individuals living with prosopagnosia. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to this channel. This way, you can be part of our growing community, and that would be helpful for me as well as our fellow community members. Also, if the video is helpful, Remember to hit the like button and please leave comments below. These are very helpful feedback for me to get a better idea of what questions you may have. And I also encourage each of you to interact with each other in the comments below. We're a community and we can all try to help each other. And in addition, please leave any suggestions you may have as to topics which you'd like me to discuss in future videos. I look forward to seeing you again. Until then, stay positive, stay optimistic, Stay dedicated and stay safe. Thanks for watching.